morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now the part you've really been waiting for, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I do want to say just a word about VBS, uh, and this is, uh, I, I do find it fascinating, by the way, uh, being here uh, most of the week and then seeing today, that during the week, you know, there's jumping up and down and yelling and running up and down the aisles and screaming, and that's just the adults, then the kids. <laughs> But I find it amazing that, you know, these kids are, I mean, honest to goodness, they're you know, crazy in a sense, in a good way. And then they get here today, and I was like, yes, I'm going to fly high. Fly. <laughs> it's because you're all staring at them. I know that's what it is. So, but, but it's okay. I, I just wanted to commend uh, what has been done this week. And, and I really want to say that we should be proud of our church for doing this because it, it's teaching these kids uh, about their faith and giving them a foundation in Jesus Christ. It, it really is. And it's something that's of vital importance, more so than it, probably it ever was before. But it's, it always has been, but more so now than ever. And it's wonderful that we take the time and effort to spend on these kids to teach them about Christ. So I just want to commend that uh, to everybody that helped or assisted or even. So let me tell you this week, uh, you know, Joyce, she doesn't just do the Bible school stuff. She uh, helps with our, uh, she does the slides and everything. And I gave her my slides for this week for the, for the sermon. And uh, she wrote back on it. She never really responds this way, but it was weird. She wrote back and, and it had big words on it said, Acts 29, Acts chapter 20, verse 9. It had it real big on there. And I was like, what? Is she trying to send me a message? What is she trying to do? So, of course, I went out and pulled out my Bible. And let me read you what Acts 29 says and see if you can figure out what message she was giving me, okay? It says this. It says, as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. <laughs> Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death. <laughs> it's scripture. I don't know what to tell you. That's what scripture says. So I took it to mean Joyce is telling me you need to shorten this up a little bit. Now, <laughs> now that wasn't something to clap about. Now, my message back to all of you is just this. If you're sitting in the first row of the balcony, be careful, okay? Because I'm looking at the clock, and I got all kinds of time. So if you have seat belts, any rope to hold you in, it's going to be a while. No, I'm kidding. I'll try, to, I'll try to make sure you don't fall asleep. I'll do my best. I, I, I wanted to talk about today... I, this is what my thought was originally. I want to talk about being a follower of Jesus. And my thought was, let's talk about being a follower of Jesus, all the wonderful things that go with that, all the, you know, you, you are, uh, you give an eternal life, you are adopted into the family of God, you become a son, a daughter of Christ, a brother, a sister of Christ, a son or daughter of God, and, and, and you get love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and I wanted to talk about that, and I realized we've kind of been talking about that for the last two months, haven't we, about being a follower of Christ and about taking that into the world. And then I, so I stopped myself and I said, I, I don't think I'm going to go that way today because I'm like other people. I mean, we're, you know, we're human beings. And when we hear it again and again, even though it's a good thing, even though we need to hear the benefits of being a follower of Christ, and you're going to hear it again today, we need to hear that on a regular basis. But if we're not careful, we start going, ah, been there, done that. I already heard that. I know where you're going with all this. Do we really need to go over it again? And, and most people, I know that a lot, I, I, believe me, I know what you're already thinking. You're saying, ah, oh, been there, done that, heard that. Uh, let's see, when was, what am I having for lunch today? Where are we going? Uh, what's the plan? That's what we start doing as human beings. It's, we can't help it. It just happens sometimes. And so I realized I don't really want to go down that same route, at least exactly that same route. So I want to do something a little bit different because what I'm concerned about more than anything is when I think of that reaction that I've been there, done that, that means we're getting comfortable in our faith 
which when you first hear it, it is a good thing. And it is a good thing to be comfortable in our faith. It's something is comfort that we as human beings seek all the time in our homes, in our places of rest. That's why we go on vacation. We're always looking for comfort in our lives. And so it's natural to look for comfort in our spiritual life as well. And it's a good thing that we're comfortable enough in our spiritual life to go into the world and, and to admit I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and to be comfortable enough to talk to people about our faith and about our church. That's a good thing. But here's my concern. What happens when comfort turns into complacency? That we become so comfortable that it's almost like, yeah, I just don't. <laughs> what do I have to do anymore? I've done what I'm supposed to. I've given myself over to Christ. Oh, fantastic. I'd maybe do something once in a while, but it's just not, I mean, it's a lot of work. And I've got a lot of other things in my life going on. And our faith life becomes complacent. And so I was thinking about that, and what came across to me to, is a scripture from 2 Peter. And 2 Peter really gives us what I'd like to call more than anything today a wake-up call. All right? This is not a condemnation. Peter is not condemning us. He's really not. It's a warning to us. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up to not allow our faith to become complacent to continue to work at our faith, to continue to grow in our faith. And so we're going to use 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to use a little bit of different scripture. I usually don't use NLT, the New Living Translation, but I, but I wanted to point that out to you. It's not the, the scripture that is in your pew Bibles today. This is a little bit different than what we normally use, but I think it really speaks to this idea of it being a wake-up call to us. And I'm going to also, you're going to see, we're going to circle back to this start. We're going to start with verse 19, and we're going to end up, we're going to circle back and end up with verse 19 again. So, let's read some scripture, and then we'll talk about it. Peter says, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. Now, that's a pretty obvious statement, isn't it? You'd have to admit, it's a pretty obvious statement. If something controls me, I am its slave. That's obvious, but and we think about it in this society, in this day and age, it's probably a negative connotation, isn't it? Like, I'm a slave to something is not something we want to say all the time. It's not something we want to admit about ourselves, that we're a slave to anything. But I think Peter means this, yes, in a bad way, as we'll get to in a moment, but I think Peter means it in a good way as well. Because, for example, if we are controlled by the Holy Spirit then it's a good thing to be a slave, isn't it? It's a good thing to be the slave to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we know, don't we? We know this, that if we give ourselves to Christ, the Holy Spirit literally comes and dwells within us. God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, dwells within us and is there to guide us. And if we give ourselves over to that and actually follow the dictates that follow the, uh, what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do, we become controlled by the Holy Spirit, but when we become a slave to God, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's ultimately, as Christians, what we really truly want in our lives. But it can also be a bad thing, can it, to be a slave if something controls us that's other than Christ because we are human beings. What normally controls us as human beings? What, be honest, what controls us? It's, it's ourselves, isn't it? It's our own egos, our own desires. That's what controls us most of the time. And, and that can be bad things. It can certainly be bad things, obvious things, things we become addicted to, gambling, drugs, alcohol, bad things. But think of this. It can also be good things, that, uh, the best intention in the world, but if it starts literally controlling us to the point where everything else gets pushed aside and off, of our, off the path that we're on, it can actually end up being a bad thing. Take, for example, my easiest example is physical fitness. Now, I know that by looking at me, you can tell I engage in virtually no physical fitness. <laughs> I do understand that. 
But physical fitness, it's a good thing. It's a, we should do that. We need to take care of our bodies that God has created us for us. We need to take care of them. But when it becomes so important to us that literally everything else in our lives, including our faith, gets pushed aside, then it becomes a bad thing. And so we have to be careful. What will control us? We want Christ to control us. But so, here's Peter saying, you are a slave to whatever controls you. He goes on, he says, and when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's talking about what I just said, that if you give yourself to Christ, you are in essence saved from your own desires. You are pulled away from the wickedness of the world. It doesn't mean the wickedness of the world is gone. It doesn't mean it's not tempting. It doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that you have given yourself over to hopefully to Christ's control and that he helps you escape from that wickedness that you were engaged in before. But then they get tangled up and enslaved by sin again. They are worse off than before. And there's the wake-up call, folks. There's the warning that if you go back to what you were doing before, you're worse off than you were before. Peter explains a little bit. He says, it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. Do you hear what he's saying here? He's saying, okay, here you are, and you've decided, you've made this life choice, you're giving yourself over to Christ. And now that you've given yourself over to Christ, before you gave yourself over, you were, let's just say for right now, it's not 100% true, but for this illustration, you were ignorant in the ways of Christ. You didn't really understand Christ and what he meant in this world. And so you have at least some excuse. It's not a good thing that you don't know Christ, but you, there's at least some excuse, even though we're going to throw that out later here, you'll see. But you have some excuse. But when you give yourself to Christ, now I know I have responsibilities. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know the way I'm supposed to live. I know that I'm supposed to go into the world and show Christ in all that I say and all that I do. But if I decide not to, if I become complacent in my faith and I just say no, then I'm literally making a conscious choice, a purposeful choice to say, no, I'm rejecting that. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm just not going to do it. And if you make that choice, Peter is saying, that's worse than before when, in a sense, you didn't make the choice. You made a choice, but it was not with Christ in the equation. Now you're rejecting Christ. So even though you're right back to where you were before, guess what? You're actually worse off because you know where you should be. You shouldn't be complacent in your faith. Now, Peter's going to end here with two, I would call, especially one of them, rather crude ways of telling us that we should not fall back to our old life. Okay? This is Scripture. Okay? So don't blame me. These These are rather crude references he's going to make. He says, they, the people that fall back, prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. Ooh, that's disgusting. I, I, I don't, well, let's move on. And another proverb says, a washed pig returns to the mud. Does anybody have a pet pig? Anybody have a pet pig? And I'm not talking about your brothers and sisters. Nobody has a pet pig. Well, if you have a pet pig, I've never had a pet pig either. But if you did, my guess is what you would find is the pig likes to lay in the mud and get dirty. Because my understanding is it helps them keep cool. It keeps parasites off of them. There's, there's literally actual scientific reasons why they would do this. But it's in their nature. That's really what it means. It's in their nature to go back to the mud. So my, in my view of this, I think of this wash pig return to the mud, that I have a pet pig and I'm taking it and I, and I take a hose and I scrub it and I make it all nice and shiny. You can't make a pig shiny, can you? Well, you make it nice and at least not muddy. And I put it in my trailer and I take it down to the farm show and the pig wins a medal, but I get to keep it because it's a pig. So I keep the medal and the pig comes home and I take it off the trailer and
and I put it, it back into its pen, and what's the first thing it's going to do? Because it's its nature. It's going to go right back to the mud, isn't it? It's going to take all that cleaning, and all of a sudden it's not going to look like an award-winning pig anymore, is it? And my point is, remember what Peter said. Peter said you are a slave to whatever controls you. So my point is this. Our human nature is that we want to control our own lives. We want to be in control. I want to allow my own desires to control me. And if we are left to our own devices, we are going to just be like that pig and we're going to return to the mud. We're going to return to the same place we were before, before we knew Christ. If we become complacent and don't keep Christ at the front of our lives, we're going to go right back to where we were before. I really think that's what Peter is telling us. And that's a pretty strong wake-up call, isn't it? And he's saying if you do return to the mud, you're in a worse position than you were before you ever came out of that mud in the first place. You're dirtier than you were before. So the ultimate message here is we want Jesus Christ to be in control, of, in control of our life. We want to be his slave. We want to give ourselves over to him, not to our own desires. We want Christ to guide us in everything that we say and everything that we do. We want the Holy Spirit within us to teach us and guide us and for us to listen to that and allow us and that we want to allow it to be our guide and us to be its slave, the Holy Spirit's slave. And really, that should be enough, shouldn't it? That should be, that should be enough today. Nobody fell out of the balcony that I saw. Nobody, no, nobody obviously fell asleep. I, I have to admit, with these lights sometimes, it's hard to tell, but I didn't see anybody obviously passing out. I don't know about some of the people in the back there in the dark. You could have. But I don't want to stop there. I'm going to take the risk that some of you may say, that's enough, stop for today. I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to go on because at my nature, and I know none of you are like this, I have a little bit of a smart aleck streak to me. That my whole family's denying this. Now, I don't know, do any of you have that little smart aleck streak running through you? And all, oh no, we have some people just admitting it, yes. All right. <laughs> yeah, talk to my kids. They, they are too. They, they don't like to admit it, but they are. Anyway, and all those of you who are shaking your head, no, not me. Those, you're exactly the ones that I think are the smart Alex in the group. But anyway, let me, here's what me as a little bit of a smart Alec would ask somebody who just said what I said. I would say, I would ask the question, I would say, so why give myself to Christ in the first place? Tell me what the point is. Because what you're telling me is, I'm going to give myself to Christ, and then what I need to do is not become complacent and keep working at my faith, to keep going to church, to being in Bible studies, to keep praying, to keep doing all those things so that I don't become complacent in my faith and I keep growing in my faith. That's what you're going to tell me. And that's work. And I've got a lot of things going on in my life. And so at some point in time, I'm going to start to get a little complacent and say, oh, this is getting too much for me. It's too much work. And then you're telling me I'm going to slide back to where I was before, but I'm actually going to be worse off than I was. Why do it in the first place? That wasn't going to be my answer, but man, let me write that down. <laughs> That's actually a very good answer. That's a very good answer. But I have two answers for you. And because I am, uh, because I'm a lawyer in, you know, other parts of the day, I'm going to have two subparts to each answer, okay? So we have answer, subpart, subpart, answer, okay. So why give myself to Christ? Answer number one, too late, too late, too late, you already have. How do I know that? How do I know you have? There's, there's people sitting here probably going, uh-uh, not me. And I'm telling you, you already have. You know why? You know how I know that? Because you're here right now. You're here today. 
And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I'm telling you right now, you have given yourself, at least taken that first step to giving yourself to Christ if you are here today. Because if the Holy Spirit is telling you, you need to go worship Christ. You need to hear His Word. You need to be in that environment. You have already listened to the point where you have at least stepped here today. And I know what you're saying. Yeah, but my kids, it's my kids. I just came because the kids are here. And I'm telling you, no, you listen. There's something else going on there. It's too late. You've already listened. But if you're going to deny that, if, you, if you're going to say, nope, 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 not me, not me, then let's go and read Romans 1.20 and see if you can wiggle out of this one, okay? Because I don't think you can. Romans 1.20 says this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. All right? So what that is saying is, first of all, what I would say is this. In our society, in this day and age, don't sit there and tell me you haven't heard of God, you haven't heard of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't believe you. I'm sorry, I don't. But if you want to make the argument, yes, but I live where there's no cell service, or I live where there's no satellite TV or cable, or I live in the jungles of South America or Africa or the outback of Australia or somewhere at a base on Antarctica, and so I've been completely out of touch with society, and I have no clue. Nobody's ever said the word Jesus to me. This scripture says uh, you still have no excuse because you can look around around you and you can see the qualities of God. You see his eternal power, his divine nature. Just by looking around you, you have no excuse. So why give yourself to Christ? Because why fight it? You already have or you're already taking that step. Second, why would I give myself to Christ? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Of course you would. It makes all the sense in the world to give yourself to Christ. It is magnificent. That's why there is no logical reason that you could possibly tell me that you wouldn't do this. Because I know I've said it's difficult. You have to keep working at it. You can't get complacent. You have to keep striving to grow your faith. And you say that's a lot of work. And I say, so what? Because here's what Paul says in Romans 8.18. He says, yet what we suffer now. What we suffer now, and that's anything, anything that you suffer, whether it be physical, mental, spiritual, whether life, how hard it is for you, how difficult it is, how much bad luck you seem to have, how dysfunctional your family may be, how little money you may have or money problems that you may have, how difficult your life is, the pain and suffering that goes along with your life, Paul says what we suffer now is nothing. It's literally nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Do you hear what that is saying? If we give ourselves to Christ and we are given the gift of eternal life and we are with God, that that glory that's going to be revealed to us is so much greater than what we are experiencing now that this is going to be nothing to us. It's not even something that we have to kind of brush off, a speck of dust that we have to, that we have to dust off ourselves. It's literally something that will be gone from our minds. It will be nothing to us. It will disappear because the glory of God, what he will reveal to us, is going to be so magnificent and so astounding that all of this is going to go away almost instantly. We're not going to even have to think about the problems that we've faced. The fact of the matter is that life is hard. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Life is still hard. But the difference that we have of being followers of Christ is the fact that we are given this gift of eternal life with God. We are given love and grace and mercy and forgiveness of our God. We become a child of God. He literally adopts us into his family. We become a brother or sister of Christ. We are separate 
separated from the world, not in the sense that we are not experiencing what everybody else in the world does. We certainly do. We certainly suffer just the way anybody else would, whether they're a Christian or not. But the difference is we have hope because we know what the end is. We know what happens at the end. God reveals His glory to us, and it is more magnificent than what we can describe today. And so I put to you today, I challenge you to not grow complacent in your faith. Allow your faith to continue to grow. Continue worshiping Him. Continue studying about Jesus. Continue to talk to Him. Grow your relationship because then ultimately when you go into the world, everything you say, everything you do will be a reflection of Christ. And that is where the Holy Spirit is leading each and every one of us here. Amen. <laughs> wow. Go ahead, you can do that, it's okay. <laughs> it is church, but God made these two hands to do something, I mean, that's okay. All right, we're gonna sing our final song today. It's the theme song from Bible School. This is like, I think, everybody's most favorite song. So let's have the kids come up, stand where you were standing before, okay? <laughs> so stand where you were standing before, guys. I know. You want to stand down here? You can. I'm going to invite you guys to stand up now, too, and sing along with the kids. Um, try to do the motions. <laughs> guys ready? All right. You ready? Here we go. Comes our drums. Right, play your drums. Through every storm of life, I know you're by my side. So I am holding on to your promises. You are the God who holds my future, all my dreams. So I am holding on. was all but gone a second chance to sing a brand new song you opened up my eyes to see you rescued me rescued me you showed the way when there was no way out cleared up my mind when you
I'm just letting you know, you can't do it on your own. If it's on your own, you're going to fall back to what you did before. So you have to give control over to God. And as we just learned, he is always there with you. He won't let you go. So go from here. Don't grow complacent in your faith, but go into this world with a confidence that you can show everyone with everything you say and everything you do, Jesus Christ in your life. Take the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit with you. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time. Good job, kids.